God reveals that Nineveh is set up to fall. Very interesting. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. My name is Rod Hembry. I'm Janice. And this is Bible Discovery TV Quick Study Television as we study the Bible from Genesis 1 to Revelation 22 every single year. Corey helps us to do that. Corey, what's up? I am looking at the history of ancient Nineveh today. All right, very good. Look forward to that. What'd you do, Jan? God has made a way. All right. And Ryan is here. Ryan, what's going on? Well, you know, the prophet Nahum speaks all about the city of Nineveh. So today I'm looking at the life of King Sennacherib, the man who apparently made that city the capital of Assyria. Wow, that's amazing. All of this is interesting stuff that we're going to look at. And the Bible is the best place to do that. So let's focus on Nahum chapter 2. Let's open it up and let's listen to what God says to us. Nahum 2, verses 1 through 10. He who scatters has come up before your face. Man the fort, watch the road, strengthen your flanks, fortify your power mightily. For the Lord will restore the excellence of Jacob like the excellence of Israel. For the emptiers have emptied them out and ruined their vine branches. The shields of his mighty men are made red. The valiant men are in scarlet. The chariots come with flaming torches in the day of his preparation, and the spears are brandished. The chariots rage in the streets. They jostle one another in the broad roads. They seem like torches. They run like lightning. He remembers his nobles. They stumble in their walk. They make haste to her walls, and the defense is prepared. The gates of the rivers are opened, and the palace is dissolved. It is decreed. She shall be led away captive. She shall be brought up, and her maidservants shall lead her as with the voice of doves beating their breasts. Though Nineveh of old was like a pool of water, now they flee away. Halt! Halt, they cry, but no one turns back. Take spoil of silver, take spoil of gold. There is no end of treasure or wealth of every desirable prize. She is empty, desolate, and waste. The heart melts and the knees shake. Much pain is in every side, and all their faces are drained of color. Nahum chapter 2, verses 1 through 10. Every once in a while, we come across a prophet. There's not much known about him, and this is one of those days. Not much is known about Nahum. He's a great prophet, though, prophet of God. He is a Elkoshite from the city of Elkosh, which we have no idea where it was. <laughs> Some scholars suggest it was in southern Judah because of the time of the book. That time is deduced from Nahum chapter 3, verse 8. It says, quote, are you better than Noaman that was situated by the river that had waters around her, whose rampart was the sea and whose wall was the sea? Close quote. Now this ancient reference to Naaman was a Hebrew word used for Thebes in Egypt. And this, it fell in 663 BC. Now, Nineveh's fall happened in 612 BC, meaning that the book was probably written between these two dates. It's very interesting when you consider that Judah was a vassal of ancient Assyrian empire and was burdened under its demands. So the book was very much an encouragement for the people of God. God is still very much involved with doing his word, doing his will in this word and in this world. Very important as we think this through and begin to understand it. God, he, you know, he hasn't written off things. He hasn't written off things. God is in the process of showing us what he's doing. And today, as we focus on this, get your Bible guide and turn to it, because as we look at this, we're going to learn what God is doing. Now, if you don't have a Bible guide, why not? Uh, you can write for your Bible guide. Just send us a letter or call us. 
We have our numbers there. We have, of course, the addresses there, but you can also do something else. And that is you can go to BibleDiscoveryTV.com. That's a website. It's our new website. There's a lot of things there that you can check us out on. There's material to download and all that kind of stuff. You can even watch this program. Some of you are watching this. Actually, a lot of you are watching this program right there. How you doing? Good to see you on the website. And it's important for us to remember that you click on the page, the front page of the Bible Guide, takes you to another page where you can donate. Thank you for your donations. They keep us going and keep us strong. And uh, let me also just say that if you are behind in reading, that's okay. Just catch up right now. Just come straight to where we're at because that's an important part to do is just come to where we're at. Nahum, it's a good prophet. And just start reading with us now. You can start by reading with us right now, even if you just saw us for the first time. So we encourage you to do that. Thank you so much. And the website, it'll make a donation. Then it'll take you to the page, the PDF files, so that you can download. God is in control. You've heard that said many times. Everybody's talking about, well, God is in control. Father, I pray today that you would show us you're in control because that's what you said in your word. Help us to understand what what does that mean? God is in control. What does control mean? We have a different thinking about control. We have to control everything. But help us, Lord, to see how you have worked with us and how you're using us and how you're asking us to come to you in Jesus' wonderful name. And we all said together, amen. As we look at this passage of scripture, consider this. It's important to do. We are reading God's word. This is the word of God. That's what I believe. Some people don't, but I actually do. And so as we do that, we come to Nahum chapter two, verse one. It says, he who scatters has come up before your face. He who scatters has come up before your face. Man the fort, watch the road, strengthen your flanks, fortify your power mightily. For the Lord will restore the excellence of Jacob like the excellence of Israel. For the emptiers of the empty, they empty them out and ruin their vine branches. The shields of his mighty men are made red. The valiant men are in scarlet and the chariots come with flaming torches in the day of his preparation. And the spears are brandished. The swords or the chariots rather rage in the streets. They jostle one another in the broad roads They seem like torches. They run like lightning. But he remembers his nobles. They stumble in their walk. They make their haste to their walls. And the defense is prepared. The gates of the rivers are opened and the palace is dissolved. I want to tell you, this is amazing. See, God reveals that Nineveh is set up to fall. Remember when Jonah preached to Nineveh? They repented, but now 150 years later, roughly, the end of time is revealed in the Bible, God's word. We should read it and be ready. Let me tell you something. If ever you want to know what's going to happen, what's going to come up, the Bible is the greatest place to be, to read the Bible and know what it says, because God has already spoken. And I when I read some of these prophets and I see about what God's doing, I'm like, I feel like I'm reading the newspaper on the front page for crying out loud. It's right there. And so we need to pay attention to this. You know, it's not prophecy is not something you don't pay attention to. It's something that God gave us and put in our face so we could see what's happening. Next passage. Watch this. It is decreed. She shall be led away captive. She shall be brought up. And her maidservants shall lead her as with a voice of doves beating their breast. What does this mean? There is no stopping the judgment of God. Remember what God said in Jonah? Well, now it's happening here in this Nahum book. No one can outthink the strategies of God. God is somebody who thinks and who understands so much more than we do. In fact, he is the ultimate of all thinking. He gave us our ability to think. So God knows exactly what's going to happen. Nothing surprises God. Explosions in Lebanon or anything, nothing surprises God. Nothing. Nothing. We need to keep that in mind. 
because God pays attention. So as we continue to read the scripture, let's read on. It says in verses eight through 10, though Nineveh of old was like a pool of water, now they flee away. Halt, halt, they cry, but no one turns back. Take spoil of silver, take spoil of gold. There is no end of treasure or wealth of every desirable prize. She is empty, desolate, and waste. The heart melts, the knees shake. Much pain is in every side, and all of their faces are drained of color. What does this mean? All the things of man will die, even his gods. That's absolutely correct. Remember that as Christians, we are citizens of heaven, not citizens of earth. God does not die. God is alive, remains alive, stays alive. He is eternal. And that's who I serve. I serve an eternal God. I serve a God who didn't make up things and create things for the fun of it, but he has a purpose and he has a plan and he knows the future and he knows the past and he knows my present. So when I pray, I pray to that God, Jesus Christ, the God above all other gods. In fact, Everything will stop and come to an end soon. Every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And I want to tell you, you, sh you need to get ready. If you're not ready, you need to meet Jesus Christ. You say, Lord, forgive me of my sin. This is how you pray. You just say, Lord, forgive me of my sin. I truly am. I feel that. Help me. I don't know what to do. Forgive me. Help me. Be the Lord of my life. Come into my life and be the Lord. That's how we pray, beloved. And that's what we say to make ourselves ready for God because God is coming back very, very soon. A lot of people are talking about the end of time. He says that, they say that, and everybody on TV says something else. But what does Jesus Christ say? The Son of God, God and man, what does he say? That's so important. We need to come back to Matthew 24 and look at that because Jesus Christ does not lie. Today, our reading comes from the very interesting Old Testament book of Nahum. Now, Nahum was a prophet and he records some interesting things that all had to do with the city of Nineveh. Now you'll remember Nineveh uh, because of its focus back in the prophetic book of Jonah, but the situation has changed a little bit where Jonah was told to go in and speak to uh, the Ninevites in order to get them to repent and, and come to uh, a godly life. Nahum here is condemning Nineveh for its evil and its wickedness. So the situation has changed in the time uh, between Jonah and Nahum. Right now, we're going to be focusing in on this city of Nineveh because it has some really interesting historical and archaeological uh, um, things to offer up for us. Take a look. The ancient city of Nineveh was settled very early on in human history. And while it was an important part of the Assyrian Empire, it had to wait until the reign of King Sennacherib to finally become the capital city of Assyria. Before the days of Sennacherib, Nineveh was known primarily for its temple to the pagan goddess Ishtar, and it must have at least served as part-time residence for Assyrian kings, as evidenced by the early royal palaces there. It would have been to this city that the prophet Jonah was sent. According to a reference in 2 Kings 14, Jonah lived shortly before or during the reign of Jeroboam II of Israel, which places the events of the Book of Jonah before Nineveh's heyday as capital of Assyria but in a time when her temple and royal palaces made her a prominent city and symbol of Assyrian power. After the days of Jonah, Assyrian King Sennacherib made Nineveh his capital. He rebuilt its walls and 15 gates. He dug a moat, built an 80-room palace that he famously called the Palace Without Rival, and filled it to the brim with carved walls and sculptures. 
Sennacherib also planted public parks and gardens throughout the city with trees and foliage from all over his empire and dug multiple irrigation channels to support this plant life. His son, Esarhaddon, continued his father's building in this city, but chose to build a new palace for himself after part of Sennacherib's was burnt in the aftermath of his murder. The last great king of Assyria was Sennacherib's grandson, who is famous for building a great library at Nineveh. He sent scholars and scribes throughout the empire to collect tens of thousands of texts that he stored in his capital. The project was a great success, but just as the biblical prophets Nahum and Zephaniah predicted, it wouldn't last. Only a few years later, in 612 BC, the city was destroyed by the emerging Neo-Babylonian Empire. From the writings of later historians, it's believed that the attackers dammed the tributary that flowed through the city to cause flooding that weakened the foundation of part of the wall, which provides collaboration for Nahum's prophecy of Nineveh's destruction. A lot can be learned about the Bible by taking a look at the history of some of the cities, people, and nations that it talks about. You know, the audience to whom Nahum was originally write, writing, you know, who originally would have received his prophecies and his words, they would have understood the history of Nineveh. They would have known not only the geography, but also the culture and the people associated with that city. So they had that backdrop. So they properly understood what God was saying, the judgment that he was bringing on Nineveh. Now for us, living thousands of years later in a vastly different culture, it takes a little bit of legwork for us to truly understand what's going on. Uh, so that is one of the benefits, just one of cultural studies like this one. We're gonna continue on in the next couple of weeks as we move into the New Testament. This concept is going to become very important for understanding the Christian, me uh, the Christian uh, message to its fullest. Right now, I'm gonna pass it over to Ryan. Ryan, what do you have for us? Thanks, Corey. Well, as it's already been said, today we're reading the fascinating book of Nahum, and this prophet's main concern is Nineveh. And in chapter one, verse 11, the prophet says this, from you, Nineveh, came one who plotted evil against the Lord, a worthless counselor. Now, while this worthless counselor remains unnamed here, this could be either a reference to one particular wicked Assyrian king or else to a series of evil kings who reigned in Nineveh after Sennacherib made that city the capital. And some even think that this worthless counselor was Sennacherib himself. Whatever the case, we do know that this king was both pagan and proud. Sennacherib reigned from 704 to 681 BC and he enjoyed a very successful military campaign. Literally all of his enemies fell by his hand. That is, until he met the God of Israel. Let's study. Five years after his defeat of Babylon, Sargon II, king of Assyria, died and left his throne to a son who hated him. For in none of his inscriptions or annals, observes one historian, does Sennacherib even acknowledge the existence of his father. Possibly this hatred was a result of Sargon publicly promoting his son as spineless and inadequate. Thus, when Sennacherib took the throne, the provinces celebrated what they believed to be their upcoming freedom from Assyrian rule. However, Sennacherib was nothing of the sort. In fact, he was bold, unafraid, and incredibly arrogant. The Babylonians saw this firsthand when he simply proclaimed himself their king rather than going through the formal ritual ceremony of taking the hand of their god. This was an insult to both Babylon and its chief deity. Soon after this, a rebellion took place. So Sennacherib ransacked the city, took almost a quarter of a million captives, and destroyed the fields and groves of anyone who had joined the alliance against him. This marked only the beginning of a very successful campaign in which he defeated nearly all of his enemies. City after city fell to this powerful and proud Assyrian king. However, ironically, for all his victories, he is most remembered for his one very unsuccessful siege. Sennacherib had invaded Judah in 701 BC during the reign of King Hezekiah. And after capturing most of the fortified cities, his army surrounded Jerusalem. With this, the Rabshaka, speaking for Sennacherib, begins to make great boasts against Jerusalem and the God of Israel, saying, what confidence is this in which you trust? And in whom do you trust that you rebel against me? Who among all the gods of the lands have delivered their countries from my hand? that the Lord should deliver Jerusalem from my hand. 
What Sennacherib did not realize, however, was that he was calling out the one true God, not the false gods made of wood and stone worshipped by his previously fallen foes. Indeed, and that one true God declared against the haughty Assyrian king that his previous enemies had little power since it was God himself that was using Sennacherib to crush those in rebellion against the Lord God Almighty. But Hezekiah was a God-fearing king, and so the Lord assures him deliverance from Sennacherib. And it came to pass on a certain night, says 2 Kings 19, that the angel of the Lord went out and killed in the camp of the Assyrians 185,000. When Sennacherib arrives only to see his army dead, he returns home. There he appoints Nineveh his new capital and builds many palaces and decorates their walls with tremendous reliefs of battles won and cities besieged. Interestingly, however, Jerusalem appears nowhere on those reliefs. Some years later, while Sennacherib was worshipping in the temple of his false god, two of his sons struck him down with the sword, thus fulfilling the word of the Lord through Isaiah the prophet. You know, although some might view Sennacherib as a hero based upon his military success, the Bible gives us a very accurate picture of the man. And that picture reveals that he wasn't somebody who we should look up to. In fact, he was a satanic king who was in rebellion to God to the day he was slain by two of his own sons. It was very, very tragic. You know, what's, what is tragic, and when we, we think about this, is a lot of people have held um, in honor um, individuals who have been very ruthless. Mm -hmm. A lot of people say, well, man, I, Alexander the Great, I want to be like him. I want to be, well, hold on a minute, because Alexander the Great was brutal. Mm -hmm. yeah. And there's a lot of people in history that, who are brutal. Mm -hmm. And it's not that we want to be like them. Yeah. And I remember when I was young, I used to pray, Lord, give me the heart of Solomon or the heart of David and the wisdom of Solomon. And then I, I began to think and I thought, Maybe not. Maybe not. <laughs> maybe, maybe, maybe the heart of you. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, <laughs> and whatever exactly. you have the for me. From I know. Yeah. We tend to gloss over our uh, human evil and look at human accomplishments or the great things that God can do through people who give their lives to Him, and because it, it's it's an uncomfortable thing to look at human nature in the face because we all have human nature inside of us and it's not pretty right it's yeah. not sin is sin is bad sin and, is gross yeah. and the greatest conqueror in the world jesus christ didn't use force he didn't use brutality what did he use yeah. he used love mm -hmm. right and that's, you know, that's what gets people people and gave his life he gave, gave his himself. life yeah and, and everyone's like wow like he's the greatest <laughs> conqueror in the world like he mm -hmm. right Took how many world. followers does he still have today mm -hmm. Right. He, he trumped everybody in terms yeah. of the leadership aspect of this. And so I think that when you erase Jesus Christ from history, then you remove that. But I'm not, we're not here to erase him from history. We're yeah. here to put him back. Well, remember, yeah, remember when people made a fuss when he was feeding the 5,000, they wanted him to rise up and they wanted him to take over. And he goes, this is not the way. Yeah. yeah. This is not the way. And I, I just, I love that because it's totally not what the human being uh, expects. It's totally yeah. counter culture. It's not the answer that we would give or we would even expect, but yeah. God's ways are different inherently. And yeah. that, you're right, that was a huge part of Jesus's message was, uh, this is what you think the kingdom of God looks like. This is what the kingdom of God actually looks like. Mm, that's very, very interesting. <laughs> we could continue mm -hmm. on all night, but anyway, go ahead, Jen. We could. Well, the book of Nahum, it's a very interesting book talking about the, the, the wrath of God on Nineveh. Um, starting in, I know we focused on chapter two, but I want to go back and look at Nahum chapter one. And it's talking about God and it comes to verse six and it says this, who can stand before his indignation? This is talking about God. Who can stand before his indignation and who can endure the fierceness of his anger? His fury is poured out like fire and the rocks are thrown down by him. This, what a description of the wrath of God. And then all of a sudden we get verse seven, the Lord is good, a stronghold in the day of trouble. And he knows those who trust in him. What a powerful turn of events in here that as we listen to this, 
Who can stand before his indignation? Nobody can. Who can endure the fierceness of his anger? Nobody can. Nobody can. His fury is poured out like fire. Fire destroys. Fire changes things that it, that it touches. And the rocks are thrown down by him. And then all of a sudden, the Lord is good. A stronghold in the day of trouble. He knows those who trust in him. You know, I had, I had things prepared here, but I'm not going there because I really feel like there's people that are watching right now that are caught up in this trap of fear. They're worried about the wrath of God. They see things and they're hearing things right now. There's a lot of people saying a lot of things about our world and the things that are happening in our world right now. And yes, there is an end of time and Jesus is coming back and you need to be prepared. But God has made a way. God has made a way for you and me. And that's through his son, Jesus Christ, who came to this earth, who lived a perfect life, fully God, fully man, and who gave himself on the cross to shed his perfect blood as an atonement, to pay the price for our sins. And he says, come to me, you who are weary and heavy laden, I will give you rest. That is our way to heaven. There is no other way. It's through Jesus Christ, his son. And you need to make a choice today, whether to accept him or to reject him. You need to make that choice. It's really important. Jesus said, do not fear. That means that he knows if you're afraid, you haven't failed God. You haven't failed him. If you're anxious about things, you haven't failed him. He knew that. That's why he said it to his disciples so many times, do not fear, because he knew that we would. How do we overcome that fear? By putting that fear into prayer, by putting that fear into following Jesus and coming to him with our troubles. When we have that fear, say, Jesus, Father God, I am fearful today. Please help me to follow you. 